with theology nerds. This is Trip, and you're listening to Homebrewed Christianity, where since the year of 2008, we've been bringing you audiological goodness. That would be podcast interviews with some of the greatest scholars around. Theologians, philosophers, scholars of religion, biblical studies, science, who knows what you're going to get, but they are indeed super nerds. And today is not an exception. Because Matt Siegel is on the podcast. That's right. The man behind the footnotes to Plato blog. Mm -hmm. YouTube extraordinaire assistant professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies. A processed philosopher and author of the brand new book, Physics of the World Soul. Alfred North Whitehead's adventure in cosmology. He's right here. And we have ourselves a good, good, good old process party. We have ourselves some cosmological reflections. And we have a bunch of fun. And by the end, by the end, oh, oh <laughs> well, I'm not going to ruin it because you're about to listen to it. But anyway, um, Matt's on the podcast. This is a fun one. I hope you're going to enjoy it. And I'm confident you will. I'm confident. I'm confident. Now, um, you definitely want to check out his books, Physics of the World, Soul. Uh, after you hear this and his YouTube, check out his website, footnotes to Plato.com. But, but, but before we jump in, I just want to remind everyone right now, we are in the middle of an exciting online class with Brian McLaren and Diana Butler Bass called Oh God What Now.net Christianity 20 Years After 9 11. Um, it is an open online class. All you got to do is sign up. You can donate anything between zero and a million dollars. And yeah, 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 maybe we started it already, but it's still going. And you have access if you join to the video and audio of the previous sessions. And you have access to them afterwards. In fact, we've got. I, there's like already 20 or so groups of people using them. So you should check it out. And then maybe you want to use it for a group discussion group. We don't we don't care. That's why it's a donation class. That's why we're trying to make it open and available to everyone. So check it out. Oh, God, what now dot net. With that, here's Matthew and me talking in the basement. Well, I was in my basement. All right. Enjoy. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is Trip, and on the podcast at like you were on the podcast eight years ago. Is that right? Was it eight? that long ago? Twenty thirteen, I guess. So yeah, eight years ago. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, everything comes back around. You, you have a brand new book, Physics of the World Soul, Alfred North Whitehead's Adventure in Cosmology, and with a title like that, it it qualifies as a lure to come back on the podcast. So, so how are you doing? I'm doing all right, Trip. Um, glad to be joining you. I'm I'm here in Northern California, and you're over in across the pond in Scotland. And it's really wonderful to be able to connect like this to to talk about some really big ideas um, that I hope will help you know shape the future of our planet and and civilization. When did you? I mean, when you go to write a book on Whitehead's cosmology, at some point, you know a particular philosopher becomes kind of a passionate dialogue partner with questions you already had. Like you have to already have the cosmological questions in order to, to, to wrestle with any intense philosopher, let alone someone who thinks it necessary to come up with their own vocabulary. Um, when was like little Matt running around getting cosmological and saying, Oh, uh, this is a good question. Yeah, well, I mean, I think ultimately for me, it goes back to like um, my my seven year old self who one day realized that his mother was going to die, and that really disturbed me for a couple of weeks. I would, you know, I, my mom would drop me off at school, and I would just like fake a stomach ache and and try to get sent home because I was worried she wouldn't be there when school was over. And um, and I only got myself out of this crisis by realizing that I was going to die too one day. And in relating to that, um, like trying to conceive of an edge to my own existence on the other side of which, what, I mean, would I cease to exist? Would I just evaporate? And it didn't strike me that that was really a satisfying answer to this mystery. And, you know, being in a relationship to that threshold as a seven-year-old sort of you know, it's not like I went out and started reading philosophy at that point or anything, but it made me 
a contemplative person um, and I can distinctly remember a before and after. And, um, but it wasn't until, you know, high school that um, I kind of initially rebelled against my, um, I come from a mixed family. My dad's Jewish. My mom is, is uh, sort of non-denominational Christian. I, I would say her Christianity is televangelism. Um, and so I rebelled against that form of Christianity, which to me didn't offer anything of intellectual substance that satisfied the questions that I had, um, but was more moralistic in a judgmental kind of way. And so I was kind of a proud atheist from 13, 14 until 16. So a few years there reading Richard Dawkins and interested in physics and, um, and then I was exposed in high school by a teacher named um, Kai Ennis. And uh, Mr. Ennis exposed me to Eastern and Western philosophy. And I, I studied psychology with him as well and was, you know, exposed to Carl Jung and a little bit of Nietzsche and a little bit of um, Alan Watts. And from that point forward, I could not stop reading, just following these, these trails of um, philosophical lineages and, and, and spiritual traditions that were even in, within Christianity that were far more um, mystical and yeah, contemplative and esoteric. And so from that point forward, you know, I had some content, I guess, to give shape to the sort of contemplative relationship I'd had to death since I was seven. Um, but Whitehead came later. Yeah. Whitehead came in grad school. Mm -hmm. So you, you talk about that kind of, you know, initial moment where, you know, awakening to your parents' finitude, your own finitude, um, it, you're setting off questions. And, you know, one of the things that strikes me about those moments is that like, getting struck with a really good question invites you to end up questioning what you assumed was the case, what was assumed is normal, what was final, the, the kind of interpretation you lay on the world um, that you just think is how it is, right? And death becomes one of those where you start to realize um, the world you found when you came into it, um, there's a lot more getting itself done in it than you know the words for. And, and I think that one of the things I love about Whitehead and one of the things you, you know, that, that pops to mind just in, in hearing your own story, when you start to you know, encounter these other philosophers and then you're like, I want to keep reading. I want to keep thinking. I want to wrestle with the big questions. I want to wrestle with religion, spirituality, mysticism, and I'm not settled with these answers and stuff like that is you know, some people uh, fall in love with the answers and others, you know, with the, the kind of uh, the questions and Whitehead, like, like uh, is like caffeine or like the most energetic insistence on, you know, like creative advance. Like it's an adventure, like all there's so much at the heart of Whitehead is like not arriving professionally, right? Like that speculative metaphysics. So like at what point did the, the way your own narrative find Whitehead, and it, what, what were the initial elements in his own thought that gave language or texture to, to the quest you were already on? Well, I mean, definitely this sense of the universe as a creative advance um, and his emphasis on creativity, not just as a sort of human psychological capacity, but as something cosmic, um, something physical, something mm -hmm. biological, um, and something divine as well. And just so that expansive sense of creativity, uh, as soon as I was exposed to this um notion in Whitehead's thought, which didn't come from reading him initially, um, I was hooked. And actually I was first uh, introduced to Whitehead by um, Terence McKenna um, mm -hmm. when I was 19 years old, trying to learn about psychedelics. Um, and, you know, McKenna, for those who don't know him, was um, sort of the, the, the Timothy Leary 2.0, you could say, yeah, who um, had a very rich intellectual um, justification for his, his exploration of psychedelics, but also a pretty rich organic um, view of the cosmos. And he would reference Whitehead as um, someone who, who understood time as the sort of accumulation of novelty and 
you know, McKenna took that in his own directions, which ultimately I think were a bit paranoid, but um, nonetheless, when he would talk about Whitehead, I knew immediately, okay, I need to know more about this guy. And initially the secondary sources I read were um, warning against diving into him alone. It's kind of like psychedelics in that sense. You need a sitter or you need a community to contain your study um, or you might lose it. And um, so I did, I waited till grad school and uh, professor Eric Weiss, who left this earth, um, I guess about six months ago now, he introduced me to Alfred North Whitehead's thought, and this was 2008, and uh, I was off and running at that point. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So the the book itself is something that started with your initial dissertation research, right? And then yeah, you come back right. to it and you know reworked and expanded it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, this is actually, I guess, technically um, the fourth edition, and the prior editions were self published. And they were um, initially it was called a comprehensive exam in my mm-hmm. in my graduate program. So prior to writing the dissertation itself, and and yeah, this fourth edition is I'd say it's about fifty more pages of new material and then a thorough revision of the the prior material. Yeah. What would you say the framing question or problem is uh, that that Whitehead's cosmology became? uh, you know, an, an asset or ally in answering. Hmm. Well, as someone who, since I was a teenager, was very interested in physics. Mm-hmm. Um, I did not pursue the mathematical side of that, but I was, I read as many of the sort of, um, popularizations written by physicists that I, as I could by, you know, people like Brian Greene and Susskind and, mm-hmm. um, Lee Small and, and, and others. And, Sean Carroll. And so I really wanted to understand what this all meant for human civilization and, and, and for my own personal existence. Like, okay, what is the cosmos? Um, I wanted to understand the evolutionary process that gave birth to, to, to my, to our species and to, to me ultimately. And when I attempted to do that, reading these popularizations, most of these physicists are more or less scientific materialists. I always felt really unsatisfied with their attempts to connect cosmology to human consciousness Um, because consciousness was always sort of a peripheral thing for them. It was off on the edge somewhere and wasn't really considered to be important for the fundamental nature of things. And that always, as a more, I guess, philosophically inclined person, that always struck me as profoundly um, misguided because after all, the knowledge that science is supposedly producing is itself a product of that evolutionary process. Mm -hmm. And so how are we as intelligent organisms capable of knowing all this stuff about the universe? If that's not a question you're asking right at the beginning of your study of the universe, then you have a mutilated view of um, reality. I think you're severing mind, sequestering it off to the side and assuming you could study matter as something mind independent how do you access that material stuff again? Like, don't you need a mind to do that? So when I was exposed to Whitehead, I realized pretty quickly what he was attempting to do was something far more integrative. And um, this book is my attempt to look at the scientific situation 100 years after Whitehead. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, he he lived through the quantum and relativistic uh, revolutions in the early 20th century. And I do discuss those but I also discuss um, complexity theory and evolutionary theory and um, try to give them a Whiteheadian interpretation whereby our physic- our understanding of the physical universe is actually, I think, through a Whiteheadian lens, best understood as a new form of what the ancients used to call the world soul. Like what we know about the physical universe today is not only not in conflict with the notion of an animate or in sold universe, but is in fact, I think, even um, more coherent interpretation by such by such a view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, you know, in one of the things I really loved about um, the book is in part one, you kind of walk through how Whitehead came to moving from being a mathematician into engaging in the sciences and then starting to ask questions around philosophy, science and such, all the way to, you know, seeking to develop a philosophical cosmology that, um, you know, reworked itself around 
the you know the breakthroughs in physics and such what do you think people don't know when they just encounter a process thinker that you start to pick up on if you actually look at the the historical narrative and situation of whitehead and see where his uh, where it, he was he felt you know driven or forced to develop a an alternative cosmology to the dominant one hmm. If you read like part five of process in reality, you know, you would think that Whitehead was, was some sort of mystic or, or poet or something. Um, and, and then he must've I had thought he was a revival profound... preacher. That was my, like when yeah. I read part yeah. five in undergrad, I, I got in trouble, uh, you know, and in a, in a philosophy of religion class for complaining about my Thomas teacher can, saying that uh, I was like, God can't change. I was like, have you read the Bible? And he's like, yeah, that's process. It's not compatible with Christianity. And I'm like, no, I've, I have Baptist preacher's kid. I've read it. God changes God's mind pretty regularly, suffers, has pathos. And he's like, no, it's process. And so I just went in the library and read it. And yeah, I read Hartshorn over the weekend. And then he footnoted the part five. So I read that in process and reality. And I was like, this is like a philosophical revival preacher. You know, that was my, yeah. if, if you read part five. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think uh, some people have the impression that Whitehead was driven primarily by, by, by a religious um, vision and that he clearly has that vision, but what brought him into a process to, into creating this process philosophy was the, sh the shifts in mathematics and physics. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he wanted to better understand relativity um, and, and quantum theory. And in some ways, his understanding of those theories in physics, he's more relativistic than, than Einstein in some ways. Though yeah, for Whitehead, definitely. that means being more relational, not just about how matter and space and time um, hang together, but how mind and matter and space and time hang together. Whitehead's profoundly relational in, in a way that I think gives, gives, gives deeper interpretation to the implications of relativity theory. Um, but yeah, in any event, it's Whitehead was driven into speculative cosmology because he saw the um, mathematical and, and metaphysical underpinnings of the old Newtonian mechanistic view of the universe just totally demolished. He lived through the, the second scientific revolution and he's like, you know, guys, we need a new metaphysics here. Unfortunately, he, he was saying this and constructing his his grand system um, or scheme, as he calls it, of cosmology, just at the time that, you know, Wittgenstein was saying uh, philosophy is not allowed to talk about that kind of stuff. Um, we just yeah. analyze yeah. language and clarify our sentences. Um, even though Wittgenstein was a little bit deeper, that's what the logical positivists took away from it. And so analytic philosophy went in a very different direction. The continental philosophers also went in a different direction. No one was doing cosmology. No one was doing metaphysics. Whitehead was sort of alone in the wilderness um, in that part of the 20th century. But now we're, we're finally catching up and realizing he has a lot to tell us. And, you know, one of the things that even in the way you laid it out in, in part one is the new science should have problematized the inherited philosophy, right? Like if the philosophical system you have assumes like something like Hume sensationalism, right? Like your access point is just your senses, or it assumes a kind of mechanistic metaphor uh, that, uh, that where efficient causation is a complete account. If it assumes it like Newton and, and company, and it assumes a kind of either dualism or atheist flattening where like mind is eliminated like in the, the way you paint the narrative, it, it's like, you can't just try to update a philosophy if the actual organizing principles of it don't cohere with just basic common knowledge about the world. And the thing I love about looking at it in history is that it's not just religious people who really like having certain certainty about the basics of their system. Everyone does. It's a human predicament, right? And Whitehead recognizes that the philosophical situation isn't is trying to include the new physics and stuff but not changing the assumptions that it ultimately problematizes and so he spends a, a quite a bit of time and you talk about this in chapter two like looking at philosophy of science and that part of the predicament that we are in is misunderstanding what science does 
right? And he has those like hilarious passages in Science of the Modern World where he's like, I don't know why y'all are worried about a bird singing. And you're like, oh, listen to the bird. Or you see a painter and you're like, they're talented. You should just give credit to your mind. Those are all psychic additions. You know, like he he gets it the way nature's bifurcated using science if nature is equals just what is determined like and resolved as solutions in science. And I, I wonder if you if you want to say something about that, because I've seen you kind of pick up that white heady and insight and engage contemporary scientists, right? Like on your YouTube channel and picking up current debates and, and do that same maneuver where you just go, uh, I'm not saying what the science is wrong. I'm just saying whatever you're setting it in means a lot of our existence is left out. Yeah. I think whitehead is trying to walk a fine line. I mean, especially nowadays with, um, there's sort of an attack on on facts, um, whether they be historical or scientific facts. And so on the one hand, you know, Whitehead would say science is not a fairy tale. <laughs> um, yeah. It's a very uh, important and, in fact, the most powerful source of truth that we have. However, he was very critical of the unexamined, unacknowledged, implicit metaphysics that sort of um, has glommed on to science for much of the modern period, namely materialism or scientific materialism. Mm -hmm. And so often in popularizations of science by the scientists, their attempt to talk to the general public and pronounce upon the nature of nature. So often in, in those situations, they conflate the scientific method and the tentative knowledge produced thereby with a metaphysics. And they will deny to their grave that they even have a metaphysics. But what White, Whitehead says in, a, is it in Science of the Modern World, maybe that he says, scientists are supposed to deny that they have a metaphysics, but what they mean is that they don't like having their own metaphysical ideas criticized. And so, yeah, he, Whitehead tries to reform philosophy of science and just clean things up and undo the bifurcation of nature, as he calls it, by saying, look, science is just the study of what we are aware of in perception. And let's leave the question of the mind and what's in the mind and out of the mind and the question of knowledge that's for philosophy to deal with. Science is the study, the systematic study of the relations among phenomena, right? And so it's a radical conception of science because it, it I think, brings into what is typically construed as natural science, something like, um, you know, Jamesian psychology or, or Husserlian phenomenology, like all these aspects of what traditionally get lumped into philosophy where we're trying to examine experience yeah, inner experience, but nonetheless, that's part of what we're aware of, you know, um, phenomenologically or in our perception. And so Whitehead would say that's also science. Um, what he points out, and, and this is a point made by Kant very clearly too, science has certain conditions of possibility, which include things like, you know, what David Ray Griffin would call hardcore common sense um, presuppositions that you can't deny without a performative contradiction freedom, you know, the, the, the capacity to, um, to reflect conceptually consciousness, in other words, is a condition and intelligence, a condition for the possibility of scientific knowledge. But if your conception of nature makes it such that the emergence of mind could only ever be something epiphenomenal and, you know, sort of beside the point, you're not providing the conditions for your own knowledge, for your own capacity to, to make that claim. And so, I think it's it's very important to to begin with with this sort of a careful examination of the difference between science as a method mm -hmm. and materialism as a metaphysics. Mm -hmm. How do you tell students for the first time uh, what Whitehead means by a philosophy of organism? Well, I first say that he is using organism in a more generic sense than biology will use that term. And that it's best to imagine organism as any self-organizing system. So his, his is a philosophy of self-organization. And self-organization takes place at every level of nature. Uh, when protons and electrons form the first hydrogen atoms, that's self-organization. Um, you know, when stars emerge and, and galaxies emerge, these are processes of self-organization. And so for Whitehead, a philosophy of organism means that um, we have to see this process of 
emergent evolution, he would say, of more and more complex modes of, of self-organization. That's what's going on here. And mm -hmm. it's not just at the biological scale that that's what's going on. Biology is a special case of a more general, a more cosmic evolutionary process. And so, you know, Lynn Margulis, the biologist, would, um, would uh, talk about symbiogenesis, the emergence of new species by the synthesis of formerly separate species. And Whitehead points to, again, the, the early um, history of the universe when protons and neutrons and electrons forged a um, symbiotic relationship with one another. They merged and established a mode of endurance that has lasted billions of years until this day, right? Mm -hmm. And so for him, that's an example of um, a, an organic evolutionary process. And so, yeah, philosophy of organism is trying to establish a sense of evolutionary continuity between the various levels of nature. There are levels, but it's the, it's the same sort of evolutionary process and the emergence of new holes, which, which then nest or unfold within them the prior holes which were achieved. Yeah. So do you think it's fair to say something like uh, a lot of times the language of laws of nature for Whitehead or something like uh, stable generative habits, right? That, that you, when you give the example of even the forming uh, of neutrons, electrons, and all that kind of stuff, like when, when they form, then there becomes a whole new layer of possibilities that emerge because there's a greater uh, network of organized mass energy events that go into the next moment. And then what it, what becomes possible in the horizon of that actual entity has greater possibility to it than before, precisely because uh, uh, something new in the way the events are constructed emerges and then becomes stable because in that stability creates generative possibilities for the future. But it's easy, I think, you know, for the scientists today to look back and then just call what were the adventure of generous, stable, right? Processes laws. And hmm. now they obviously have trouble. Maybe if, if you're a good materialist deciding what mine or gave the order of the law, right. Hmm. But it still functions as something you don't have to explain if in the hidden in the language is these are just the case, right? Yeah. I think Whitehead, like Charles Saunders purse mm -hmm. um, would see many of the laws of nature, so-called more like emergent habits. And, you know, um, it's pretty clear now looking at cosmology that, um, you know, we've needed to, or I should, they have needed to sort of mathematically um, invent these values for something called dark matter in order to salvage our the the Einsteinian understanding of the rotation uh, of galaxies. They didn't rotate at the rate expected based on Einstein's original equations, so they had to invent all this extra mass that we can't detect because it's invisible. Nonetheless, it makes the equations work. And so they're putting the model before the reality in this way. And then dark energy, which shows that the universe's expansion is actually accelerating. And so it, it's like our old understanding of gravity as a law. Now, all of a sudden is being the law is being broken in all these interesting ways. We can insist on construing it as a law with being broken or adopt a more organic view of this and say that there's an evolution unfolding here and the nature of gravity is itself part of what evolves. And so, yes, um, that's a consequence of a more organic conception of the universe. But I think it's important to remember Whitehead's um, primordial nature of God. Mm -hmm. And there is, there is an aspect of the divine which um, sort of sets the, the preconditions, doesn't determine the universe, but sets the, arranges the field of possibilities according to an, an ideal vision of harmony. Mm -hmm. And so when physicists talk about fine tuning and that there are these certain mathematical variables and constants that are appear to be tuned just so as to give rise to all this order later, life, consciousness, and so on. Um, and that just the slightest like, you know, decimal place off would have led to just chaos. I think while most of the laws are habits, there's also this aspect of the eternal and its mode of participation in time and in, evolu in evolution to provide a tilt toward 
complexity. Mm -hmm. And so Whitehead's a process thinker, but, you know, as he says in that last part of process and reality, he's not trying to do away with permanence, right? He's trying to find some way of harmonizing or establishing a contrast between what we're conflicting opposites, process and permanence. He wants us to be able to, in some way, do justice to both. Mm -hmm. When you looked at Whitehead's cosmology and then started to wrestle with it in light of contemporary scientific thought. Like if you think of Whitehead being alive today, what are the the scientific conversations or philosophical ones do you think would be most energizing and animating for him? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Interesting to, to think about. Um, the fun yeah. part is, is if you guess the ones I think you would guess, see, that's like the, the uh the real fun part you know yeah well i think he would be interested in the transitions between um these levels of nature uh abiogenesis like the origins mm -hmm. of life um there's a lot of interesting research going on now um about the chemical processes and the um, environmental conditions required to allow for something that before life emerged seemed rather improbable um, just the, the, the chemical pathways that, that needed to, you know, sort of self-assemble into whether it's liposomes and, and longer polymers of amino acids and nucleic acids, like a lot had to go just right. And there was a lot of practice and trial and error for this process yeah. to work itself out. But I think Whitehead would be fascinated to apply his metaphysics to this scientific problem. And I think um, I'm actually collaborating with an astrobiologist named Bruce Damer to try to do just that. Like, what? how can Whitehead's metaphysics help us understand this transition? Um, I also think Whitehead would be interested in consciousness studies, which, um, again, how does consciousness emerge? Though Whitehead would question that whole framing, I think, mm -hmm. uh, because as a, as a pan-experientialist, you know, um, it's not like consciousness just pops into existence out of nothing. There was a, a, a gradual process of um, complexification and intensification of experience uh, in order to generate something like consciousness, which even we human beings <laughs> barely experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, we're mostly running on habit, right? Um, and the, the intense novelty and, and freedom that comes in flashes is, is super powerful and important, but it's also um, only a small fraction of what we are, you know? And I think Whitehead would have so much that would be helpful and clarifying. I, and I, hopefully people would listen to him. I mean, I'm trying to interpret his ideas as best I can in this discipline of, of consciousness studies and philosophy of mind. But I think he would be very keen on getting in there and saying, you guys, come on, like, I got something that I gotta, I gotta share with you here. Um, consciousness is not like parachuted into this universe from another dimension. You know, it's been part of the mix since the get-go. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the project you're doing with the astrobiologist. That just sounds fascinating. Oh yeah. Um, well, as it happens, the center for process studies is hosting a conference later this year, um, at Willamette university mm -hmm. up in Salem, Oregon. And, um, it is, the conference is titled something like Astrobiology, Exophilosophy, and Cosmic Religion. I think I got that all right. And and so, um, you know, Bruce Damer and I were already kind of collaborating. We, we, we'd applied for a Templeton grant for science and religion, and um, we didn't get it. Um, but um, we were looking for other ways to collaborate, and this conference um, was was being organized and they invited us. And so it's given us an excuse to go deeper into this. And basically it's uh, Bruce Damer works with a lab, a, a team at UC Santa Cruz that's led by um, David Deemer, who's a biochemist. And they've developed what's called the hot spring hypothesis for the origins of life. And it's now the main competitor to the sort of mainstream hypothesis which is the deep sea hydrothermal vent story. The idea is that four billion years ago or so um, in these freshwater ponds on volcanic islands that were sort of geyser fed and would regularly um, 
dehydrate and then rehydrate. And so there's a cycling that goes on. And the crazy thing about astrobiology is that, you know, they've realized that at the time of the early earth, when the oceans had, had formed and the first land was emerging, these volcanic islands, there was literally um, through comets and asteroids, amino acids and other or organic molecules were just raining down from the sky to seed these pools with the chemistry required for life to emerge. And so mm -hmm. it's like just the universe throwing out free gifts. And these in these shallow freshwater ponds that are cycling through wet and dry phases, there's a, a process of chemical selection which begins to take place. There's something called a liposome or a mycel, which is like a, a bilipid membrane of like these fatty molecules that can form spheres mm -hmm. just spontaneously. It's called self-assembly. It's it's uh, just the free energy principle. Like this shape is just the, it's like the easiest way for nature to organize. Um, and this creates the cellular membrane basically that encapsulates chemistry within it, amino acids and, and polymers and dehydration allows longer polymers to emerge. And so you get this engine of complexity or this um, it's like an improbability station in, in this environment. And I would think of Whitehead's term sheltering that he talks about the environment sheltering the emergence of novelty. That's exactly what's going on in these ponds with the cycling and a process of chemical selection unfolds, which the idea is gradually ratchets up to the ability to maintain structure and have metabolism and reproduce. Um, and so the way that um, Bruce Damer, David Diemer and their colleagues describe this, it's the emergence of evolution itself in the biological sense, at least natural selection and niche construction and so on. Um, it reminds me so much of Whitehead's process of concrescence. It's like a special example of the process of concrescence whereby the many become one and are increased by one um and so you know bruce damer and i are working on sort of ironing out the the connections here between the metaphysics and the, the biochemistry and mm -hmm. we're pretty excited about the, the the way that the uh stars are aligning as it were oh that's that's really cool and you know if the increase by one is the emergence of life then that's a that's a pretty good crescendo for a concrescence. <laughs> yeah, right. That was a pretty potent concrescence. Yeah, in that. <laughs> it became very trendy. Um, yeah, you you know earlier you mentioned that you know there are these transitions if you look at the big cosmic story, um, but that process view, uh, process cosmology sees the transitions differently. Something like the origin of our space time the emergence of life in whatever way like you ju you just talked about um the reality of mind right like the pan experientialist doesn't think it just invented out of nowhere but it also is affirming its reality and then some maybe something like value right or beauty aesthetics mm -hmm. aesthet the aesthetic judgment in things like that i find discussing those four things that are normally labeled transitions which for Whitehead are more kind of intensifications because of the nature of, like you mentioned earlier, the primordial nature of God is simultaneously uh, valuing the possibilities in a moment towards like a, a teleology. How do you see the, the normal discussion around these kind of problems for scientific materialism, like the origin of our space, time, mind, life, value, those type of things. Uh, how do you see them retold when you take a process cosmological view? Um, because sometimes I think the big picture m is what makes all the details seem like worth learning, if that makes sense. Like the when you see the big picture from a process view, you're like, oh, okay, that's why all the details about the nature of an event and all that kind of stuff matters because we're trying to give more parsimonious account of a universe where we aren't relativizing, deflating the uniqueness of our space time, the reality of life, the vibrancy of mind and the beauty and value of existence. That's a great question. How would this all be reframed? I mean, Whitehead says in the function of nature, when he's discussing the evolution of reason itself, which includes science and philosophy, how did this evolve? Um, how did our capacity to understand evolution evolve? And so in that context, he asks why we're so obsessed with a form of explanation 
that tries to reduce the later, more complex forms to the earlier, less complex forms, the simpler forms. So in other words, like, why are we obsessed with this notion that the human being can be reduced to a collection of atoms moving through space? And he says, why can't we reverse this process? Why can't we look at the more complex forms and use that as an analogy to understand what must be the case about the simpler forms? Because after all, those forms gave rise to us. And so it totally inverts your normal uh, understanding of explanation and allows you to see the way that the universe is, is a seed in a process of development and that what unfolds later tells you something about what was enfolded originally, right? And so we can work our way backwards from the intensity of human consciousness, of, of human scientific insight, of human uh, religious rapture, of human artistic uh, capacity. And we can ask, what must the universe be such that this is possible, right? And for Whitehead, that's a rational account. It's actually more rational than trying to pretend like none of that stuff is real and that we're actually, consciousness is an illusion and we're just atoms falling in the void. Um, and so it's it's a total inversion, but once you make that that shift, it's, you know, yeah, you can never see the world in the same way again. Mm -hmm. And so, so when you use the word world soul, what are you trying to, to mm -hmm. capture with that? And are, are there particular ways people hear it? You want to cut off at the pass? Yeah. I mean, so this gets into theology, I guess. I mean, there, there have been um, in the Catholic tradition, historically, and in the Protestant tradition, traditions, um, reasons to want to avoid this ancient doctrine of the anima mundi or of the, the world soul, because it seems to divinize nature. And I think there are in Whitehead's scheme still reasons to distinguish between God and the world. I mean, he, he does quite, quite clearly. And yet there's also deep intimacy uh, and relationship between the two and neither can exist without the other. And so um, world soul for me is a, it's an ancient metaphor and an ancient analogy and ancient, really a vision of the, of the cosmos that I'm trying to resuscitate in, in a context, a uh, contemporary context where I don't think it actually has too many, uh, there's not that much baggage with it actually, you know, I mean, maybe in new age circles, People might have some overly um, kind of romantic view of it. I mean, I'm a romantic. I won't. I don't want to put romanticism down. It's a profoundly insightful uh, tradition in philosophy and the and, and poetry uh, literature. But um, it's, I guess, sentimental. Maybe is the better word. I don't want an overly sentimental view of this world soul because just like with Whitehead's understanding of God, God is creator and destroyer. Uh, and there's a way in which um, a divine spark can really unsettle the social mores that it arises within um, and only be recognized as good 10 generations in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and so world soul for me is a, is a way of mobilizing a sense. It's, I guess, a participatory sense of um, the place of the human being in the cosmos that our own souls are not alone in the world, that we in fact are um, the participants in, in a um, cosmic life. And that, as I discuss in the book a little bit, when we think about afterlife and immortality, Whitehead was neutral on the question of personal immortality. And I think, you know, again, in reference to my early experience with death, I don't see any rational means of knowing what happens after we die. I do get the sense though, that it's a transformation mm -hmm. and the soul that I think I am while alive in this body uh, now, I guess the, the, the personality that I feel that I am will might just be the caterpillar for something else after I die, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think human beings do need to make reference to something, some form of immortality I don't know that it needs to be personal. And so the world soul is sort of this reservoir of, uh, of meaning that by which we can um, connect with some sense of continuity after the death of our individual souls. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, And I, and I think, you know, when you say that, especially for those that, you know, may have listened to like Christian or Jewish theologians that are process people and you hang out with academics that will tolerate whitehead, but not religion or people that are thoroughly some tradition, right. And the process versions exciting always are in this moment where you try to explain whitehead where you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, Plato was a great philosopher at his time. And you can't have Augustine without Plato, but they're like, Augustine is a Platonist. Plato is not an early church father. You know, like, yeah. the, and, and that's not a knock on either one of them. And they also saw their tasks as different and saw that the, uh, ex, they had different experiences that were in different kind of mythopoetic structures, but also they had different data because a person in a religious tradition has a kind of particularity of a place of reflection that's different in the same way whitehead is a metaphysician like now he was formed by being a, a pastor's kid and then when er his son eric dies in world war one it triggers wrestling around the problem of evil but he also had like bouts with uh narcolepsy right like and he couldn't or it, narcolepsy is you can't sleep right uh, isn't that when you fall asleep no and, the opposite of that yeah uh insomnia insomnia there you go yeah. and I mean, Lucen Price talks about him in his insomnia that he read through his dad's all his theological library looking for answers and got all upset, right? Like, so like he's deeply informed by the Christian tradition, but like you tell in the first part of the book, like he comes back to believing in God because of science and philosophy, right? Like in science in the modern world, it's like a baby step, the principle of limitation, right? So that you can explain the big story the, with a trajectory and all that kind of stuff to then in process and reality going, well, what if the if God's not an exception, then God has to have a mental pole as well. So you get the consequent nature of God. And then um, he has students like Hartshorn or whatever. And then people learn it and use it in, in a religious tradition. That's one of the things I, I love about your explanation. It's like there are so many different ways a cosmology or a speculative metaphysics can go. And, and I think in the academy, um, I guess in France and Germany, a little ahead of the re the Anglophone world, people come back to Whitehead without the baggage of it being distinctively form of Christian theology. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, I think I think his cosmology is inspiring and viable, you know, apart from the identification of a first century homeless Jew as the image of the invisible God. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you are going to identify one person as the image of the invisible God, and they die cross dead. It probably like Whitehead's got to have the most efficient metaphysics for affirming yeah. the ultimate power of persuasive self-giving love. But mm -hmm. it, it's not entailed. Like, how do you see that? Because I always, like I come from someone like I'm an ordained, like I marry and bury and baptize, serve the Eucharist. I do all of that. I mean, I'm like a progressive Protestant. So probably most Christians don't know if I count, but I perfectly, I think I do. Like, how do you see that ambiguity in Whitehead? Because he's reintroducing the world soul question, right? Or uh, these type of religious spiritual questions in the academy where there's like just an allergy to anything beyond um, the thin layer of reality Dan Dennett will give a thumbs up to. Right. Yeah. This is a really important and, um, I might be pretty personal in this, in this answer, reflecting on this, because, you know, I did reject Christianity when I was a teenager. And then as I, I studied more, you know, initially from a kind of Jungian depth psychological perspective, I realized, oh, if I think of Christ as an archetype and the role that that archetype has played in the evolution of consciousness, and then as it plays in my own experience, I actually after I was finished with those Terrence McKenna lectures and I ate mushrooms for the first time at that time in my life, I was calling myself a Buddhist. I was meditating. I was, I was going to a Zen temple. Um, this was, uh, in Orlando and, uh, Orlando, Florida. And I ate mushrooms for the first time and had an experience of Jesus, um, profoundly life-changing experience for me that didn't, I didn't run out and join the nearest church or anything. And I still resist 
most of I've I've tried different institutional forms of Christianity, um, the Episcopal Church, you know, in in you know I know the Bishop of California pretty well. He, he was a student in my grad program actually, and you know I connected with them. But it, when it got to the some core doctrinal issues, I was like I can't go for that. Mm-hmm. But I do I through Whitehead in the intellectual depth that he provides, understanding the nature of the divine. I agree with you you know, that the God as the fellow sufferer who understands, um, you know, God as this persuasive power of love, I, you know, Whitehead says that the power of God is the worship that God inspires, yeah. you know, and to me, that, that is an inspiration and, and personally, emotionally, you know, mm-hmm. um, psychologically. And so I, I, in the way I think about this, I think Christianity has um, a future if it has the future, I hope it has. It'll be a lot more like the early Christian community than any form of institutionalized Christianity. And I know that institutions are important, but I think spirituality needs to be in that hot magma form if it is going to serve the function that it is intended to serve. Um, we have other forms of, of human existence to hold you know, to enforce the rules and, 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 and all this other, and, and, and to form community, that community is an important part of religious life. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't mean to um, discount that, but as Whitehead says, you know, following William James, religion is what we do with our solitude. And in some sense, um, the deeper religious questions are ones we each have to wrestle with for ourselves. And then through discovering, hopefully that the ultimate ground of the divine nature is love come back into community and under yeah. that with that understanding um but i think you know ultimately i'm a i'm a non-denominational non-institutionalized christian i would have to say um and i don't often share that i don't feel the need to like mark fill that out on a form because i feel like that would be a <laughs> that would be a um mischaracterization given what that usually there wasn't means. a box for that <laughs> yeah yeah and so sometimes i'll say christian hermeticist because i'm trying to gesture towards you know this sort of esoteric stream in in the european history of philosophy mm-hmm. and religion um i'm half jewish as well and so i i do feel some connection um to the you know to the prophets and i i thought about being a rabbi at one point when i was not doing well in college. This was during the, when Bush was elected again in 2000, it was, he would have been elected in 2003, become president again in 2004. I was like, this whole enterprise sucks. I'm dropping out. I wanted to just be a renunciate and whether it was going to India or becoming a rabbi, I was like, I'm out, I'm done. Thankfully my dad said no way. And I continued with my education, but uh, I mean, who knows? I say, thankfully, I'm glad where I ended up, but maybe I would have been happy as a rabbi too. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I went to art magnet school, so I was in theater half of my day from middle school on, right? Like, uh, through, you know, in the college where I started as a theater major before hmm. uh, switching to philosophy. But that meant I had lots of Jewish friends. That meant I met all the rabbis that were the- theater kids, rabbis. So they were always like the coolest people. They read <laughs> the same things I did. I was like, you like talking about like Nietzsche and Kierkegaard and Hegel? Like, okay, great. <laughs> um, and they, they, they would give like interpretations of Bible passages. I knew as the Baptist preacher's kid where I'm like, mm-hmm. that's wild. That's awesome. How, you know? And then when I met Rabbi Artson, I was like, well, you know, if I get some bad, really bad, like devastating material, when it goes to historical Jesus stuff, I just gotta go, go, ra- go rabbi. Like he didn't have to do as much work as a, uh, Jewish process, uh, rabbi. As uh, Christians do, like you have a, a kind of particularity that uh, speculative metaphysics, I don't know, wouldn't value with the level of intensity that a uh, process rabbi does that. Right. We talked about it at some point on the podcast, and I was like, oh. plus, he might just be the co- one of the coolest people ever. Yeah, that yeah. might be the other side. Have you listened to his lectures on the Kabbalah? No, I haven't, but I, I oh will. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there and like he doesn't even promote uh, it's some weird podcast feed. Like it still has like just the Lipson graphic. Like he clearly just I has put no effort. But <laughs> for like years he would like I guess 
once or twice a month during the school year, do a lecture, like a process interpretation of passages from the Kabbalah. And it's just like, I'm just wow. like from the Zohar or something. I got yeah, it. I got exactly. It. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, I really appreciate you, you know, sharing that story. And I wonder, like, how does that make you think of, I mean, you talk about not having a box to check. And when you said that, I thought of when I was doing my PhD at Claremont and then after uh, I worked at the largest UCC church, United Church of Christ was like the most progressive like, at the denominational level and still mm-hmm. Christian denomination. And I did a survey of our congregation and I had like 300 and some people respond and half of them check none. Oh, wow. You know, and so I, I wonder what that is, right? Like, because, and I went back through because I was like, what, you know, either yeah. uh, like it did make sense. And some of them were like baptized lifetime members tithe at a liberal Protestant church and others were, you know, family members of someone that really cared. They liked the, they liked the uh, being in the bell choir and the poetry. But I do think that when you talk about the future of religion, spirituality, there is a sense that the institutions were for so long wedded to the, a monologue symbolic register of a culture Mm -hmm. that once you realize the potency of the multiplicity of symbolic registers that we now get to encounter and benefit from the idea that you're going to attach yourself to an institution that demonstrates this anxiety and fear about that pluralism is just unbecoming. Yeah. You know, and, and yet I completely get the sentiment you gave of like, well, if you're going to locate yourself somewhere, then the fellow sufferer who understands or the, like that passage of religion in the making where, where he's like the brilliance of Christianity is you have like the dead Lord on a cross killed by the empire. And you go, all right, explain this, you know, right. where, where whatever story you give the big picture you give after that is not one where you're the cross builder, but you're the cross bearer, right? Like the image of power is the auto deconstructible for whitehead. Um, mm-hmm. Like, like, what do you make of this spiritual religious moment? Because I don't know. I often feel more at home without a lot of the labels. And yet I feel like there's something we leave behind when we forsake traditions with whatever gets itself done in those life transitions, in the myths and the rituals and the stories and the narratives. And I mean, myth, ritual, stories, and narratives in the robust sense, not the reductive one. Yeah. I mean, the religion of late capitalism is me. And that's true whether you're it's the worst little, religion it's 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 a very def, it's it's depressing it's world destroying uh it's violent um it's ignorant but it's the religion of me is pervasive on the left and the right um in different forms and mm-hmm. i think we're in a situation now where even for people who do identify as religious and I'll speak in the context of the U S cause I know it well better than anywhere else, obviously. And, you know, conservative Christians with their prosperity gospel stuff um, it's not Christianity. It's, it's the religion of me. And I think there's a certain form of self-righteousness on the left as well. That is, it's like, it's religious in form without any sense of the transcendent. And so it's trying to realize a utopia. It's trying to realize heaven on earth in a way that's actually going to be potentially violent or at least elicit a violent response from those who don't want to go along with it. And so, you know, I do identify it more as a, a, a left wing, um, you know, uh, political figure, even I've campaigned for Bernie Sanders and mm. um, I can't tell you how deflating and disappointing that whole thing was twice in a row. And, uh, but nonetheless, I think that without a deeper religious vision and not just, I think spirituality has become so packaged and co-opted by consumer culture that I don't know whether that word really can can do yeah. the work we need it to in this context. Um, we need a vision of the transcendent and 
in process relational theology, I mean, obviously imminence is important too, but transcendence means a conception of the good that is beyond what you as an individual or even you as the member of, of whatever congregation or whatever, um, you know, ethnicity or whatever nation, you in any of these finite identities, you don't have the good all for yourself. You don't possess the good, right? Mm -hmm. The good transcends history. And in some ways, um, while we do want to progress toward a better, more just society, we're never going to be able to realize the utopia because the nature of evolution is creative advance. And there's always going to be these creative sparks that unsettle the established mores, mm -hmm. you know? And so Whitehead was pretty Nietzschean when it comes to good and evil, right? Um, these are relative to the socio-historical context. The divine in this deeper way doesn't take sides in these historical cultural fights over what morality is we, we ought to how we ought to behave right because of an evolutionary process i mean there's clearly a movement away from force towards persuasion that is that is the arc of the universe bending towards justice right or, mm -hmm. or bending towards goodness um but other than that other than the movement towards more love and persuasion as the the, the means by which power is expressed um we don't know what will be good versus yeah. bad a hundred years from now. Don't um, you think part of it is like having been in California for a while and then lived in the South right before we moved to Scotland, like I went back home with kids that grew up in Southern California and then saw my normal world from the South and were just offended by things that I were just my normal. And I think we succeed as a generation when our grandkids think we're vile for things we hadn't examined. And that's not a failure. That's success, right? Like they were able to both trust themselves and the lure of peace, the possibility of peace in ways they became at home in the world with less fear and anxiety than we did, right? So um, if you were in a very multi-ethnic context in Los Angeles and you go back and you're visiting churches with your family. And my son's like, we can't go here. Everyone's white. This can't be Christian. Right? Like <laughs> if you're in the South, you're like, yeah, I guess that's the case, Elgin. But I grew up there. So that was just how it was. You know, I'm like, yeah. no, no, no. We exchange choirs twice a year with the black church with the same name. And we don't mm -hmm. discuss why they have the same name on the same street. Right? Like, the, and I didn't think about it, but he grew up in a different context. And then, and I feel like th that was one of those moments where I thought a lot of the section on civilization and um, Whitehead's adventures of ideas started to make sense that a successful grandparent is one whose grandkids think they're out of date for good reasons. Yeah. And that meant you did the right thing, right? Like you handed on something that had blessings and curses in it. And the ability for the grandkid to notice it. There's going to be things that are connected to the environmental crisis that our grandkids are going to look at us and be like, you did what? You know, <laughs> like, I know there's going to be a couple of those, but who knows you what they are. Yeah. You produced how much plastic every week Yeah, <laughs> from the grocery store trips? Like what, where do you think it went? Where did you think it went? I don't know. Some place I flew over when I went home, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right about the environmental, the ecological crisis being the point that even, you know, I recognize it more than my parents, but, you know, the next generation is, is still going to have a lot of um, reasons to be upset with us too. Um, mm -hmm. Just from what we're used to, it's like, we just, you know, I, want, I have the air conditioning on right now. And uh, it's probably powered. It's either nuclear powered or, or fossil fuel powered. Right. And so um, for my comfort and I get it how decades from now that that will be not looked upon with, with much um, thanks. <laughs> so I have an idea I've been running through my head recently about this and I, I I'm very interested in what you think what you think about this it's kind of derailing our conversation well no well it's extending it but it's not specifically related to the book um 
I think part of the present spiritual predicament is connected to two factors. Like one is the, the kind of late modern world requires dynamic stabilization. Every institution requires growth, right? Like for it to be healthy. And then growth has this demand that's always put upon the institution and then is put into the individual. And so you're always, uh, the modern subject is always having to gain just to avoid loss. The perpetual deferral of possessing whatever it is we're hoping to get to, right? Utopia, the good life or whatever uh, is kind of the, con- they, we're always trying to get to just the conditions of it. And then if you take that type of drive that, that just gets ratcheted up through modernity and then connect it to the, the kind of like ethical pluralism of our present state where the, the questions of the good life get privatized because we're wanting to affirm the multiplicity of wisdom traditions and individuals, right? Like the ethics of authenticity uh, come where the individual has a demand upon you and they locate themselves, identify themselves. Well, then the individual is the place you get questions about the good life, not the community or the institution or the, the whole. And when we can't have a unified account of the good life, it's not that unified accounts don't impose themselves on us, instill themselves, like enforce themselves on us. It's that the market becomes the vision that then occupies the whole, uh, the culture, and the possibility of the good life is something we're stuck in where we have to always gain to not be losing. Think of all the crazy things we do just to not be behind. We have to do that or we get what? kicked out of the system and we no longer count. We're the forsaken subject, right? Agamemnon yeah. talks about that. And, and so if the good life, it always involves this quest for scope, more wealth or options or capacity or, or time, but mm-hmm. the particular, it, it involves a way of relating to the world that means we never have conversations about what the good life is because we've always already given over the public conversation of the good to the private and the individual subjects always occupied. And Mm -hmm. I, I, it has all been like popping in my head in the last few weeks. Um, And I just think there needs to be a relational way of thinking through that. Um, But, but does that make sense? Like in the sense of if we ask, what is the good life? Our proper response is, well, I don't know. Maybe you should listen to your heart. Then you tell me and I can help you with that. But then the economy wants us to always know you're still on a quest for the preconditions of the good life. And so we're mm-hmm. like seeking after stuff. Think of what parents do just to get their kid in the best college and then all the debt. Like It's like everything's speeding up and our soul's being sucked out. And because we don't recognize economism is the world religion, then we don't get to entertain the right questions that could lead to a different world because we're already plugged in and committed. And if we decide to opt out, there's nowhere for you to go. And what do you do? Yeah. This is my nihilistic nightmare I've been wrestling with that I decide you, you shared mushrooms meeting jesus and uncomfortably being christian this is uh you know reformed anthropology might be too accurate i don't know you know <laughs> oh no I, I i think you painted the picture um and articulated that quite well and i i share that that um critique i mean the, the religion of me is the religion of of capitalism is the mm. the sense in which the good life has been the determination of the good has been turned over to the individual. And, you know, I think of in, in the American context, the way that um, capitalism is defended and it's really needing to defend itself more now, which is interesting. The, the, the story is that we don't want to impose on the individual any um, belief system that's not theirs. And so we want to maximize individual freedom. And the more we get into this nihilistic nightmare of of neoliberalism and the atomization of society and the loneliness and the isolation, the more it seems to me that it's actually individualism that is the imposition. Yeah. Right. 
And uh, we don't have freedom as isolated individuals. We're cut off. Freedom is through association. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we lift each other up uh, in community. We establish new conditions to realize uh, higher goods collectively. And that's not to say well, communism is better than no. This this is this is not about political ideology. This is ultimately about ontology. Uh, this is political ontology, and and there's an anthropological component to it as well. Like, what does it take to be a healthy human being? Well, you obviously need relationship from the moment you come out of the womb, and even before that, you need to have had a loving mother who took care of herself when you were part of her body, and you need to be born into a loving family that's gonna teach you how to do this um, and, and allow you to express what you come in with um, by being loving and accepting and nurturing. And we forget how, the, like, even after we've, we've entered adolescence and we're individuating that we still need that relational context mm-hmm. to form a healthy identity. And I think the oppositional nature of our politics leads us into these shallow mutilated forms of, of ideological identification. And we, we lose that um, relational dimension of what we, who and what we are. We get reduced to the lowest common denominator, which is the market. And that market serves as the source of the only goods that, that we're capable of imagining, which is yeah, money and wealth, celebrity attention, even if it's just my five minutes of fame on, on Instagram or whatever, uh, pleasure and the notion of anything higher becomes like, whoa, what you're, you're trying to impose on individual freedom. And it's like, no, ultimately I think what's really causing us to suffer is the imposition of this individualism on a species that's actually, we're profoundly empathic relational beings. And the structure of our society is, it has to go to such extremes and, and lengths to isolate us in the way that it has. And I think it became more apparent to people how social we are and relational we are during this pandemic when, when many mm-hmm. of us were, were locked away and, and unable to, to be with friends and family. And I don't know how much that recognition will influence how we move forward because it seems like they're just cranking all the engines back on and we're rushing ahead at full speed in the same way we were before. Um, it's like, I think, come on, guys, this might have been dress rehearsal for the more severe, deadly pandemic that with climate change and habitat loss and all that is right around the corner. So I hope we learned something. Um, but yeah, I mean, I wrestle with this too. The more I think about it, the more I'm convinced that the only viable solution, and it's, that it's not a given that it will succeed, is, is a sort of religious revitalization. And whether that takes... It'll take plural forms, you know, it mm-hmm. won't just be one religion that dominates, but it will be a new, there's got to be a new sort of meta religious context within which um, particular traditions and, and, and um, transformative symbols and, and, and stories, narratives can um, take on importance again for us that again, point to something that's transcendent and that gives us a sense of orientation that we're not always going to like as individuals who want pleasure and want wealth and want celebrity. Sometimes, you know, being, being a virtuous per- person doesn't always mean you're a happy person necessarily. Right. And happiness has become something that capitalism says like, we, like we all deserve to be happy. And if you work hard, you know, and get rich, then you can be happy. And this is like, you get to go to heaven when you're rich because you can be happy because you have whatever you want. And it's like, that's not even true, first of all, but nor is happiness. Happiness is an emotion mm-hmm. and it's different from virtue and it's different from the good and it's different from leading a meaningful life. And we need, I think, a transcendent locus of orientation in order to move beyond these shallower forms of, um, you know, belief structure that are, that, that really don't satisfy. When you say that, I think of the distinction Charles Taylor makes in a secular age about secular three, like the current condition is one where everything's been placed on the imminent frame. And so the question isn't like, do you reintroduce a supernatural transcendent? It's, does the imminent plane spin closed or spin open? Hmm. Um, 
and, and because like transcendence is not like you know a deus ex machina or something like that right like yeah. an interruption yeah. or an intervention it's a different disposition on the imminent plane like towards if you're if you're a white headian <laughs> towards the yes. pos- like possibility right like something like that mm-hmm. and i think that uh it, it, he gives us a side um where he goes something like the one of the easiest ways to tell if someone's dispositions towards an open or closed spin in on the imminent plane is to tell them the story of St. Francis. Hmm. And if they hear the biography of St. Francis, I'm like, that's not rational. That's crazy. You know, or like why I would never do that. Like, why would you vow? Well, why are you putting a picture of him in your garden, like a statue in your garden? Right. Like if that's your response, close spin. And hmm. he's like, regardless of religion or whatever, like you hear the story of St. Francis. And then the response is, wow, like that's beautiful. <laughs> Like, like he just left all that. Like he has like a, he has a real purpose in life that extends beyond himself and is connected to his, like, you know, it, all those type of responses. And I thought that's like a real good, like kind of test because I know plenty of Christians who are wonderful, faithful members of an institution who think St. Francis is crazy as hell. Yeah. Huh. Right. Uh-huh. And, and, And it used to be like when we think of that test, right? Like I had congregants, you're going to check none if they don't have, you know, Christian mystic with attachment to Jung next to it, you know, and also (laughs) mushrooms are involved, right? Like those, (laughs) those are not check boxes, but for so much of a modernity, the question of whether you're religious or not, or do you, do you participate in a historic institution? Mm -hmm. And Taylor's whole thing is that question just doesn't work. And so the question's open or closed. And so one of his little test cases are when you hear the biography of St. Francis, are you moved or do you go, what WTF? And yeah. what, what do you think about that? I, 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 I was rereading it for a class we're doing for homebrew. And I was like, that's such a good, that's such a good test. It just makes perfect sense to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I love that. Um, the secular age, um, Sources of the Self is another important mm-hmm. book for me that Charles Taylor contributed. And yeah, the, the imminent frame, I think, is is the context within which modern life takes place. And this open and closed spin is, is great to get at the ways in which, you know, when I was using the term transcendence, I certainly didn't mean to refer to um, a divine being that exists above the universe to whom we can petition for help to vanquish our enemies and enrich ourselves or whatever. Um, it's not that kind of transcendence. Um, it's, it's one of my teachers and colleagues now, um, Jacob Sherman at CIIS, he likes to say, transcendence is the superlative form of imminence. And maybe he's getting that from some other theologian, I'm not sure. But um, as you're saying, the open imminence or in Whitehead's sense, this um, this creative advance that God is as subject to as all other creatures and you know where God's role is to is to lure and evoke intensity of experience and beauty um, into an open future, rather than a coercive engineer who has designed it all in advance and punishes anyone who strays from the the proper course. Um, it's a form of transcendence. I, when I say that, I mean a um, that there is. There's an openness to to the course of history, and um, that there is there are there is something luring us, and that we can't know for certainty exactly what it is in some logical or scientific way, but it speaks to our hearts, and that that um, heartfelt sense of of where we can go is sorely lacking in our. Um, political discourse and in, in it's lacking for the most part in the arts, it's lacking in popular culture, it's lacking um, in philosophy and, and in academia, you know, so I think we need some collective sense of that and it needs to be vague enough, generic enough that it is pluralistic so, so that all the different traditions can find a place within that, again, that sort of meta religious vision that can be approached from all these different perspectives. And the vagueness there is uh, like that no expression owns the source, not that each expression is situated, particular, and embodied. We, 
like mm-hmm. I know you meant that in the sense because you're thinking process, but I think a lot yeah. of liberal thinkers, right, like think for it to be the like, vagueness means lack of specificity. And in, in some sense, it's the specificity that enables the richness in any situation, in any collective. Like or even you mentioned earlier about Whitehead and James talking about like religion is what you do in solitude. And the dialectic is religion is world loyalty, right? Like mm-hmm. what's going on? But you, but like in one sense, it, religion has to do with the way in which one attends to one's own subjectivity. And when you attend to that properly before the holy, then it, it the reciprocal movement is to move oneself into solidarity with uh, like all living things. You know, that doesn't always work, but like, if you just tell the story, like even, even in religion in the making, um, you know, Whitehead observes, he's like, if you just take the Judeo Christian narrative, like you see the, the expanding boundary of those in which you have solidarity with, right. Mm -hmm. To like the, from the tribe to, to, you know, you're the, the, from like the people and family to the tribe and it goes all the way out to the world. And I think that after Kant, one of the problems with philosophy of religion after Kant is in recognizing the need to be humble about the ultimate. We also uh, detached ourselves from the particularity of the very situated places in which intense religious experiences happen. And they're in like religions, in context, in communities, in spaces. Right. And so there's, I mean, there's always that tension. Sorry, that was a derailing aside. Yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, it's tough to make room for unity and plurality within the same sort of, you know, meta scheme. Yeah. Um, it's hard to figure out the best way to do this that truly invites everyone to the table without giving anyone, without allowing anyone to capture the flag, as it were. Because, um, yeah, the particularity is so crucial. Um, and, you know, in many ways, William James and as Whitehead inherits James, um, this pluralistic ontology, even um, it's the reality itself is plural. It's really a defense of the particular against being subsumed into the universal. Um, and so, but you're right. The vagueness is a term Whitehead uses in different places um, to talk about sort of the encompassing mystery at the fractal edges of our consciousness. That's, you know, we feel it through our viscera. We don't have a clear sensory perception of it, but nonetheless, it is of massive importance to what mm-hmm. we do have focused perceptual uh, perception or conception of. Um, and so I was more gesturing towards a sense of some background um, context within which religious life could be valued again in its various forms. It, it's like uh, when you're in college and your roommate comes back from a really, really good first date and then proceeds to explain it. And you're like, that sounds fine, but you look totally on drugs, you know? And they're like, I'm not It's just <laughs> so good. And you're like, ah, eh, that's a, you know, it's a vague description. You're like, I, I get all the details and all that kind it's of You had to be there. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, earlier we were talking about how, the modern subject is problematized. I was wondering, it, and this is something I've been thinking about. La- I started thinking about last week when I was re-recording lectures on philosophy of religion and Marx. But mm. I, I decided to put back in a section on Marx's alienation, which led me to reread it. And he, you know, has five different. He has like a five-folded kind of account of alienation. Like you have the alienation from your work um, that occurs in the context of work, then from the products of work, and that like you could see there, like this, like kind of the economic mode, but then the alienation from nature that takes place through industrialization and such, then alienation from your fellow human beings because the economy built on the alienation right terms comes to mediate so much of the community and then set the terms for things we would even call altruistic or neighborly. And then Mm -hmm. it ultimately leads to the alienation from uh, other human beings to ourselves. Right. And so then you're stuck in a place where what is op what you're doing is working against even your own self. And that kind of like, 
fivefold form of alienation, then in our, I think, late modern context, like when you look at the way that dynamic, uh, dynamic stabilization, the constant need for growth gets uh, ratcheted up is because then you get like economic growth has to happen. Um, technological acceleration keeps going. So you always have to like adopt and adapt. Uh, social cultural innovation is always going. There's this like constant speeding up of things and they're all tied to our modern conceptions of freedom and happiness, right? Like economic growth, technological acceleration, social cultural innovation are connected to what we, how, what we even mean by freedom and happiness. It's like, when are we free? Like we're trying to get extra time. So we've got to be super efficient, blah, 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 blah. Like think of how much more shit we get done using technology and stuff. It has not increased free time. Come on, America. Like, yeah. Uh, I get emails in Scotland. Like you got to make sure you actually use your paid vacation. Um, the uh, it, 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 and the same thing with like happiness or, or or the good life. And so I feel like there's if the predicament is this thick account of alienation, then the needed response is a rich account of relationality. What pulls us back into relation with ourselves? fellow human beings, nature, products of work are no longer just work, but creation. And then the places of work are no longer for just simply, right? For economic means or the shareholders before the community and your coworkers, right? It's the reintroduction of relationality embedded in the local community, your family and friends and all that kind of stuff that we really yeah. need. Does that make sense? Like I, 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 the alienation bit in Marx thinking process, because those were the two lectures I was working on going back through and re-recording. I was like, Oh, what's the opposite of alienation? How do we then take the fivefold alienation and rework it? Yeah. I mean, I have deep appreciation for Marx's critique of capitalism. Um, I think we still need to work out the, what, what, what we construct to replace it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think his analysis of alienation at these in these various forms is is spot on. And you know, we live in an economy in an economic context where um, extraction and exploitation is the name of the game. And you know, the whole um, purpose of the economy, the way it's designed, is to extract uh, the the labor and the 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 value of environments um, out of localities and and out of individuals and communities and extract it into the coffers of, of transnational corporations and and for dividends to pay out to the shareholders and it's like this model is not serving anyone even the super rich people even the billionaires i don't think they're any happier i mean at least they have you know food water shelter and and quite opulent uh uh food water and shelter but nonetheless um I'm sure they still struggle with anxiety and depression and all sorts of worries about what to do with all their goddamn money. I mean, um, it's gotta be stressful to have billions of dollars. You have no idea what to do with, what could you possibly want? I mean, you have to stay up late at night and unable to sleep. Just imagining what do I want? What do I want? I mean, I can, what about you know, flying the space with your brother? <laughs> right. Well, while you know, destroying hundreds of thousands of items in an incinerator. In your I saw that. I just saw that. Yeah. It's um, it was an Amazon mean, reference for people that didn't know. Yes, they they literally and, and that was in the UK. I'm sure. They oh yeah, no, it's those. across the street from like uh, if you cross the bridge in Edinburgh, it's like the giant distribution right. center. So it's capitalism is supposed to be so efficient, right, at delivering the goods to the to the people that want to buy the goods, and and yet the waste is just unheard of. Um, so you know. Alienation. What's what's the what's the the treatment for it? Um, yeah, it's 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 connection to people, place, uh, and planet. You know, um, mm -hmm. we need we need uh, a relational vision, like I was trying to get at earlier, that that shows how this is not something extra or something. Um, it's not dessert. It's like we are we are constituted by our relations. Mm -hmm. And we need to recognize that and we need to 
you know, accept that there is, there is no um, amount of economic growth and technological progress that's going to change the fundamental existential nature of human existence. Mm -hmm. And so instead of having a, a, the whole society oriented towards the future and how much better it's going to get if we just, you know, keep plugging away at business as usual, um, we need to, you know, as Whitehead would say, arrive in the present and see that the, you know, the, the, the whole of eternity is present in each moment and that um, there are, maybe we can call them cultural technologies mm -hmm. um, by which we can um, orient ourselves more toward that. I guess it's the imminence of eternity, if you want, um, and that we can be satisfied with that rather than needing to project off some imagined future when, you know, we'll finally get to take those vacation days or, you know, we'll finally have flying cars or whatever it is that people are imagining like, Oh, you know, Elon Musk will invent these uh, commuter rockets. And so I'll be able to get to London in 30 minutes. Like, yeah, that's also a problem I had. I mean, and so it's just a reorientation towards a, a humbler way of, of inhabiting the planet, which will actually probably lead to more fulfilling lives, you know, because we won't have this alienation. And there's a whole set of political and economic changes that I, I could, you know, um, speak to you about for, for ages. And the challenge is how to, how to, how to um, get this, passed legislatively i mean given the the the, the situation in, in washington and i don't think parliament is much different um there's just it's hard to see the avenues through the existing political institutions for these sorts of changes to to take place and so you start to wonder if maybe in some sense the collapse of the existing institutions is our best hope as i don't say that lightly because it will be painful and chaotic and and tremendously, um, you know, destabilizing for the existing institutions, rotten as they are to collapse. And so I wouldn't wish for that, but I wonder whether they can be reformed at this point. Yeah. And in the crazy thing about that wonder, which I definitely have is how much I can simultaneously think that might actually be necessary. And the sooner it happens, the better off for the whole. And I'm going to do whatever the hell I can do to minimize the possibility it affects my children's lives. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I hear that. And, and, and when I say that, like, I feel like what goes is going on in me is one of those moments of like, like Israel in the wilderness when they go like, but I'm, Egypt wasn't that bad. <laughs> right. Like, because you can't imagine a world not determined by the laws of Pharaoh. And, and because that whole space of transition is so uncomfortable, you'd rather choose bondage on a game you're comfortable with and have learned and internalized than really open yourself up to a different way of being a people together. And that wilderness space outside the reach, right, of uh, Pharaoh's sovereignty, they ultimately makes you realize how much you've internalized Pharaoh. And mm -hmm. I, and as a parent, I in lockdown where like, you know, we hadn't really been here very long. So we basically are in a country at least five hours, mostly eight from anyone that we've known more than a year. Like I realized this whole thing sucks. If they aren't going to wake up with this thing, we're screwed. It needs mm -hmm. to go down. Oh, also, the people that do have guns are the family members probably not committed to the well-being of what comes next. And um, anyway, you like all those things go through your head and then you realize, yeah, I hope that doesn't happen because I got to strategically think how to be a parent. So my kids can, I guess, succeed in a system I know is sucking my soul and will suck their soul out, but there's not another option till the thing collapse. Like whatever that feeling is. Ugh, and I know it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I, I understand the, the thought process there. And it's 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 a conflict that I, I struggle with internally. I don't have kids, but I, I also, you know, recognize that sometimes um yeah, upsetting old habits unleashes chaos and that sometimes um 
you know, we just have to be careful what we wish for. So again, I, I, you know, yeah. I'm not wishing for anything to collapse. I'm just wondering, <laughs> just wondering. Um, okay. I didn't get to most of the questions I planned on talking to you about, but I have one fun one for the last question. Okay. So let's imagine like one of the people that are leading a faith community hears this and they're like, all right, well, I think, I think I want Matt to come visit my church on zoom and preach because like, I want to bring his hype. What, what narrative or text are you going like, if they're like, look, we know, we know you're not like down, down, but you're semi interested. If, if we gave you the pulpit, what, what text does Matt want to uh, have, have as a space for proclaiming ish, you know, there'd be various scenes from the gospels that I would want to, to talk about. Um, you know, there's Jesus going into the temple to, to turn the tables over of the, the money changers. Um, the only time that Jesus is violent, you know, and, and angry um, that I, I think in the new Testament. Right. And I think there's a lesson there for our times because we really need to disambiguate Christianity's relationship to empire. Um and, you know, I think we have a lot of um, examples of what that looks like in the context of like um, African-American uh, Christian leaders, mm-hmm. like I think of Cornell West, uh, you know, chief among them. Um, also, there's a there's a the story of um, Jesus with the probably prostitutes. Some say it was Mary Magdalene. I know that's not necessarily the. I mean, there are different interpretations of who this might be, but the the Pharisees come to Jesus and they have this woman who was who was caught with a, a adult, adultering who, with whoever, and um, you know they say Jesus, she broke the law. Um, what do you say? And he says nothing at first, and finally he's like, "Let he among you who is free of sin be the first to cast a stone." And um, to my mind, the the difference between how Christianity is wielded as a source of judgment of non-normative forms of social existence from what Jesus is trying to teach in that moment is, is vast. It's, and, and so, you know, I would, I would want to highlight that as an ethical lesson about the nature of sin. I think sin is, is something, this is another thing I maybe should have mentioned earlier about what's missing in our contemporary cultural life. Everyone, especially in California who are vaguely spiritual or whatever, they think that sin is this horrific doctrine that, you know, is just judgmental and makes us feel bad about ourselves and judge others. And it's like, yes, when we're judging others as sinful, you're missing the point, you know, it's about your own sin and your failure to live up to, um, you know, uh, existence as a loving being who is willing to sacrifice yourself, you know, to, to, to take care of others. Um, that's the sin that's important, you know, to, to, to wrestle with that within ourselves Mm -hmm. and to never cast stones at others, you know, you've got plenty of your own sin to worry about. And so, yeah, I, I would probably try to, uh, to wax on, 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 a, um, some connection between these two stories in the Bible and, uh, our current time. Um, it would probably be fun for me to preach on, on, on these themes actually. Well, I, uh, I hope this functions as a lure for the <laughs> invitation, uh, for you to do so, but thank you so much for hanging out. It's been a blast and I, I promise it won't be eight years until, you come back on because I, well, I got two pages of notes that we didn't get to talk about. Great. Uh, I'm easy to derail when I like the person and a topic comes up I've been thinking about and I, you know, flip the switch from interview to conversation. I loved it. I loved every minute of it. And I've been doing this sort of zoom book tour recently and I'm tired of talking about the book. So I'm glad we had a more um, wide ranging hopefully relevant conversation. So thanks for those questions. Oh yeah. You made it to the end of the podcast. You're a winner. You went full nerd on this one. (laughs) And that means one of two things. You are either a member of the homebrewed community. And thank you for supporting the podcast, going to homebrewedcommunity.com or you're a potential one. And if you're that potential one, consider this your invitation. You get to support high quality online nerdy excitement like this and you get access to the private facebook group you get access to the members only secret podcast feed Mm -hmm. 
Oh, and you get to go to bed every night knowing you help make this kind of nerdy excitement possible. And uh, <laughs> did I mention that when you sign up, you get an ecclesiastical title? Depending on what you donate each month, you become an acolyte, a deacon, an elder, a bishop. You could be a bishop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it comes with lots of power. Like, well, it it's a label with, that seems like it comes with power. Sorry. Enjoy.